I returned to the Omura base in a dark mood. The devastating attack on the airfield, with the loss of many close friends, Mikiko's death, and my own wounds, all contributed to a general despondency. Furthermore, despite the proximity of the airbase to my home, I would not be allowed to visit my family until my wounds were completely healed. I viewed with misgivings my first meeting with the personnel commander at Amura. When I was assigned here the previous year, his contempt for and unfriendliness toward all trainees was painfully apparent, and this distaste embraced me as well. To my surprise, the commander grinned broadly at me when I snapped rigidly to attention before his desk. For a few moments, he stared at me, surveying my uniform, my face, my eyes, which stared directly ahead. He actually beamed at me. I did not know it, but the news of my solo attack against the twelve Russian bombers, despite the negative results, had preceded my return to Japan. No longer was I the contemptible trainee to be shunted around. The commander informed me that I would be able to rest easily at Omura, that for the time being I was not even to be given any specific assignments. This turn of events was astonishing. Enlisted men were not entitled to such treatment. At the mess hall, I realized that my flights in China, with my air victory and the attack against the Russian bombers added for zest, had made me a minor hero to the pilot trainees at the base. It was a wonderful and strange feeling to have these men crowd around me, eager to hear about the air war on the Asian mainland. For a week I relaxed, sleeping as much as I desired, and watching the students on their training flights. Then I received a letter from a girl whose name I failed to recognize, Fujiko Niori. She wrote, I am the sister of Mikiko, and I wish to take this opportunity to thank you with all my heart for your letter to my mother, and also for your kind words and attention to my younger sister. Your letter to my family was a ray of sunshine when we were all despondent over Mikiko's death. I am not ashamed to tell you that we all cried that Mikiko should be lost to us when she was the happiest. I must confess that, until your letter arrived, I held the illusion that all fighter pilots were interested only in combat, and that they lacked warmth and emotion. Your letter has, of course, changed that opinion. If it is to be permitted, I wish sincerely to become your friend, especially on behalf of my sister. My happiness will be complete if you will answer this letter. In the envelope was a portrait of Fujiko. If anything, the eighteen-year-old girl was even prettier than her sister. I replied immediately, telling her that I had sustained slight wounds in China and was now back in Japan to complete my recovery. I told her that the doctors felt I would soon be able to fly again and that, once healed, I hoped I would be able to see her soon afterward. Her second letter was in my hands in a matter of days. Fujiko wrote at length of her life and the daily events in her town of Tokushima on Shikoku Island. For the next month, with little to do at the Omura Air Base, I spent much of my time writing letters to Fujiko and reading hers several times over. Her correspondence was extremely well written, and I wondered whether or not her initial letter drafts had been edited by her mother, a not uncommon practice. In November of 1939, I received my first overnight leave in a year in order to visit my mother and family. With my wounds completely healed, I was anxious to make the trip home. The train ride would be barely more than an hour. At home I knew, the rice harvesting was over. The paddies and fields would be desolate as winter approached, but this was of little consequence to me. After the drab Chinese mainland, my home province would appear to be nothing less than a garden and, as the train rolled toward the village, I watched the beautiful Kyushu mountains towering into the sky, rich and green with the thick forests, the streams sparkling in the last afternoon sunlight. I could not believe my eyes as I walked down the road to my old small house. A big crowd milled about in the yard, and spying me in the road, surged out in a throng to shout their greetings. I was astonished to see my mother accompanied by no less a dignitary than the village master. Not only was this esteemed gentleman on hand to welcome me personally, but almost every village official crowded about to extend his hands in warm welcome. The village master in a loud voice proclaimed, Welcome home, Saburo, the hero of our modest village. I actually blushed, 
I had never dreamed that such a thing could happen. I stuttered and tried to tell the village master that I was anything but a hero, just a petty officer who had shot down a single Russian fighter. Tut, tut, he interrupted. Enough of your denials. It is all very well to be modest, but we all know that you are the winner of the Emperor's Silver Watch in the Navy Flyers School and that you were selected as our nation's most promising airman. I couldn't say a word. The events of five years ago flashed into my mind when I shuffled down this same road, a family and village disgrace, with my own lifelong friends turning their eyes away in shame. Had they known, these people, of how I fumbled, almost helplessly, in my cockpit in that first combat, or how my captain had been speechless with rage at my conduct. And now, all this. It was overwhelming. Then a grand barbecue began in the narrow yard. There were heaps of food and many bottles of sake, rice wine. I was still upset and bewildered by the unexpected welcome until my mother called me aside to whisper, they have all been so good to us, and all this food has been contributed by them in honour of your homecoming. Do not frown and scowl so. Return the honour by being pleasant in your manner. Everyone present insisted on hearing everything that had happened in China, and they kept interrupting to demand that I tell all the details of my combat against the Russian fighter and how I attacked the Russian bomber formation. It was strange to hear these elderly folk, the most respected of our village, professing their admiration of what I had done. But most wonderful of all were the shining eyes of my mother, who fairly burst with pride for her son, and the rest of the family, my three brothers and my sisters, adorned in their best clothes, sat happy and smiling, just watching the events of the evening. I had precious little time in which to speak to my mother. The festival lasted the better part of the night. When our guests took their leave, however, I soon realised that our family was still as impoverished as when I left for the Navy. My mother stilled my fears with the assurance that the entire village had helped her in her labours, that our neighbours could not have been kinder. During my stay in China, I had sent the better part of my salary home to the family. There was little use for money in that country. I never drank, or indeed, entertained any girls. Both were considered vices for fighter pilots and I wished no criticism levelled at me. Saburo, my mother continued, we are grateful for the continued help you have given us by sending home most of your pay. But now I wish you to stop. You have been contributing too much of the funds you need for yourself. It is now time that you began to think more of yourself, and to begin saving for your marriage one day. I protested heatedly. I had managed to save a tidy sum myself, and had no plans for marriage for a good many years to come. Suddenly I recalled Fujiko, with whom I had been corresponding daily. It occurred to me that, had I remained in my own village instead of enlisting in the navy and rising to pilot, her family position would not have permitted her to more than speak to me. Back at Omura, the personnel commander returned me to flying status, and I began a series of intensive training flights, regaining a sure hand at the controls of the fighter planes. The second week in January of 1940, I found my name posted on the bulletin board, with orders notifying me that I had been selected with several other pilots to make an exhibition flight over the large industrial city of Osaka on February 11th, our National Foundation Day. I rushed a letter off to Fujiko, telling her of the flight. Her return letter asked me where we would be staying in Osaka, for my parents and myself wish to visit you in Osaka on this day. A visit from the family. It was an honour indeed, for it required a full day's journey from Tokushima across the inland sea to Osaka. The exhibition flight went off easily. Japan looked beautiful from the air, with the neat and orderly fields and rice paddies, the cultivated gardens and parks. I saw schoolchildren in their yards, forming characters which read, Banzai, as our formation passed overhead. Late that afternoon, with the flight completed, we moved into our rooms in an Osaka hotel. I had barely shaved and changed into a fresh uniform when one of the non-commissioned pilots dashed down the hall and bellowed lustily, Pilot Sakai, get a move on! Your fiancé is downstairs waiting to see you! Everyone laughed and cheered as I reddened and hurried out. Fujiko Niori was stunning. I stopped on the stairway and just stared at her, holding my breath. 
She was dressed in a beautiful kimono and waited for me with her parents in the portico. I could hardly speak, and it was an effort to take my eyes away from the girl. I stuttered and bowed. That evening, the Niori family took me as their guest for dinner to one of the famous restaurants in downtown Osaka. I had never even been in such a restaurant before. Fujiko's parents were wonderful to me and did their best to make me feel comfortable. But I could not avoid feeling self-conscious, for it was obvious, to them, Fujiko, and myself, that I was being studied and examined as their daughter's potential groom. Increasing my anguish was the knowledge that the Niori family was one of the most distinguished in Japan, that they came from one of the outstanding samurai groups in the country, and that Fujiko's father had attained eminence as a college professor. During the dinner, I refused a cup of sake poured for me by Mr. Niori. He smiled and urged me on until I informed him that, as a fighter pilot, I did not drink. My reply, it was obvious, was pleasing to the entire family. The night ended all too quickly, and the goodbyes at the hotel were to be the last for a long time to come. It ended, however, with unspoken but obvious approval of me as Fujiko's suitor. Back at Omura, I resumed the dawn to dusk training. Spring passed, and then the summer had come and gone. I was still at Omura, cursing the delays which kept me at the training field. What buoyed me up were the letters which came uninterruptedly from Fujiko. In that respect, I was filled with hopes and dreams. But I had become depressed. I received letters from my former pilot friends who still flew in China, who wrote in glowing terms of the air kills they made from week to week. Almost all of them by now were aces, pilots to be feared by the enemy, as they wove a pattern of absolute air supremacy in China. The good news came at last, with orders to transfer to the Kaohsiung Air Base on Formosa. It was just one year since I had returned from China, and I was chafing to return to action. By now, Kaohsiung had become Japan's main outer air base, and a transfer there meant combat assignments soon after. Before I left, however, I bought something I'd wanted for years, a Leica camera with a sonar 2.0 lens, then considered the best camera in the world. The purchase of a camera would hardly be considered of special importance to most people, I imagine, but it represented more than three months of pay, and it wiped out almost my entire savings. To me, the Leica was a beautiful and precision-built gem. I had a special use for this particular type of camera. Our fighter planes did not carry the automatic cameras so familiar to American pilots, and the Leica was particularly well suited to aerial photography from a cockpit. At Kaohsiung, I was in for a tremendous surprise. On the airfield, I saw strange new fighter planes, as different from the familiar Type 96 Claudes as night from day. These were the new Mitsubishi Zero fighters, sleek and modern. The Zero excited me as nothing else had ever done before. Even on the ground, it had the cleanest lines I had ever seen in an airplane. We now had enclosed cockpits, a powerful engine, and retractable landing gear. Instead of only two light machine guns, we were armed with two machine guns and two heavy 20mm cannon as well. The Zero had almost twice the speed and range of the Claude, and it was a dream to fly. The airplane was the most sensitive I had ever flown and even slight finger pressure brought instant response. We could hardly wait to meet enemy planes in this remarkable new aircraft. We put the new fighter to its first test in the occupation of French Indochina, flying top cover for our army troops, which occupied key ground positions. This meant a non-stop flight of 800 miles from Kaohsiung to Hainan Island. This was an incredible distance for a fighter plane, especially with much of the flight over the ocean. It was carried out without a hitch sheer wonder for us, who were accustomed to the short-ranging clods. There was no opposition, however, as we patrolled over the occupation forces moving into Indochina. Except for some minor border skirmishes caused by uninformed regional French troops, our forces moved in quietly and without trouble. The occupation, of course, was conducted peacefully after agreement with local French authorities that prevented open war. The Zero's combat trials were postponed, until we were rotated back to the Hankou Air Wing in May of 1941. Back in the China theater, we discovered that the enemy pilots had lost heart for fighting. No longer were they aggressive and quick to attack, 
as were the three Russian fighters which jumped our fifteen clords in my first fight. The enemy pilots eluded us at almost every opportunity and would engage only when they had the advantage of plunging out of the sun in a surprise attack. Their timidity forced us to invade deeper and deeper inland to force them to do battle. On August 11th, 1941, I was assigned to one such mission with the express purpose of forcing the enemy into a fight. It was an 800-mile non-stop flight from Ichang to Chengtu. This was familiar territory. It was over Ichang, then enemy held, that I had challenged the 12 Russian bombers. On our penetration flight, we escorted seven twin-engined Mitsubishi Type 1 bombers, better known during World War II as Betty's. The bombers took off from Hankow shortly after midnight, and we picked them up over Ichang. The night was pitch black, and our only landmark was the whitish Yangtze Valley winding its way across the dark country. We arrived at Wenqiang airstrip before dawn, circling slowly until daybreak. Finally, the sky lightened. No enemy fighters appeared. We watched the flight leader bank his zero and dive. That was the signal to strafe. One after the other, we plummeted from the sky toward the airfield, where I saw Russian fighters already moving along the runways on their takeoff runs. Their ground crews were running frantically over the field, heading for the trenches. I pulled out at low altitude, coming up behind one E-16 fighter as it rolled down the field. It was a perfect target, and a short cannon burst exploded the fighter in flames. I flashed across the field and spiralled sharply to the right, climbing steeply to come around for another run. Tracers and flak were to left and right of me, but the Zero's unexpected speed threw the enemy gunners off. Other Zero fighters dove and made strafing passes over the runways. Several of the Russian fighters were burning or had crashed. I pulled out of a dive to catch another plane in my sights. A second short cannon burst, and there was a mushrooming ball of fire. There was nothing left to strafe. Our attack had cleared the field of enemy planes, and not a single Russian aircraft was able to fly. The majority either were burning or had exploded. Back at 7,000 feet, we noticed the hangars and other shops burning fiercely from the regular bombing attack. It was a thorough job. We were disappointed in the lack of air opposition and continued to circle, hoping the towering smoke would draw the enemy planes. Three zeros suddenly dropped out of formation and raced for the earth. Far below me, I saw a brightly colored biplane hedge hopping over the ground. In a flash, the three fighters had jumped the enemy plane, hurling bullets and cannon shells without success as the skillful enemy pilot rolled right and left snapping his slow but agile plane through wild gyrations to evade the slugs and shells. All three fighters screamed up and away from the unscathed biplane. Now it was my turn, and I caught the biplane dead in my sights and squeezed the trigger. He was gone, rolling violently off to the left, cutting around in a turn too sharp even for the Zero to follow. Another Zero joined the fray, and the five of us slewed desperately through the air to catch the elusive enemy in our sights. That pilot was an absolute master. The biplane was almost like a wraith as it snap-rolled, spiralled, looped, and turned through all sorts of seemingly impossible manoeuvres. We were completely unable to catch him in a solid burst. Then suddenly, we neared the summit of a low hill west of Chengtu. The biplane pilot had no choice but to clear over the hill, slow rolling as he climbed. It was the one mistake, the one fatal error which no pilot is allowed. His belly flashed before my sights, and the cannon shells tore through the floorboards into the cockpit. The biplane fell off into a wild spin, even as another Zero threw useless shells into the ship with a dead man at the controls. It crashed into a hill and exploded. That made two, and my first with the Zero. That was our last combat action in the China theatre. Shortly thereafter, we moved up to Yimcheng, a small city far up the Yellow River. During several weeks of air patrol, we failed to encounter any enemy aircraft. Early in September, all naval pilots were returned to Hankow, where we were surprised by the appearance of Vice Admiral Aikichi Katagiri, the naval air force commander in China. The Admiral told us that we were to be transferred back to Formosa, where we would fulfill a most important mission. The Admiral did not elaborate, 
but it was obvious to us all that open war with the great Western powers seemed imminent. In September, we were back on the island. A total of 150 fighter pilots and an equal number of bomber crewmen moved from the Kaohsiung Air Base to Tainan, where we were organized into the new Tainan flotilla. The entire Pacific was about to explode. Chapter 7 On the 2nd of December, Vice Admiral Fushizo Tsukahara, commander of the 11th Air Fleet, sent the first reconnaissance planes over the Philippine Islands. They returned on the 4th and 5th to take photographs of Clark and Eber Fields and of other major installations near Manila from a height of 20,000 feet. The photographs of Clark Field shown to us clearly revealed 32 B-17 bombers, three medium-sized aircraft, and 71 small planes. The Navy estimated that on Luzon there were some 300 combat planes, of all types, a figure which we discovered later was twice as high as the number of planes actually in the Philippines. Our reconnaissance planes were not alone in this type of activity. American PBY Catalinas were seen on a number of occasions over Formosa. The twin-engined flying boats came in on cloudy days, flying slowly at an elevation of 1,500 feet, leisurely snapping pictures of our ground installations and aircraft. The American pilots were amazing. With their lumbering, slow airplanes, they should have proved easy prey, but we failed ever to intercept a single PBY. Whenever the air raid alarm shrieked, dozens of our pilots scrambled into the air, but invariably the Catalinas slipped into the heavy cloud cover and escaped unscathed. Their pictures, taken at such low altitude, must have told the Americans everything they wanted to know about our air units. When we reached Tainan as part of the new flotilla, we began a new and intense training period. All the men were restricted to their home fields. From daybreak until late at night, seven days a week, in all kinds of weather, we were engaged in training flights to learn the finer points of escort missions, mass formation flying, strafing runs, and so forth. Our original attack plan for the Philippines called for the use of three small aircraft carriers to bring the Zeros close to the enemy islands. They were the 11,700-ton Ryujo, the 13,950-ton Zuiho, a converted submarine tender, and the 20,000-ton Taiho, a converted merchant ship. Theoretically, the three carriers should have had a combined capacity of 90 fighters, but their actual operation figure was closer to 50 planes, and even this number was halved on Wendy days. Tsukahara found the three ships almost useless for his purposes. If, however, the Zeros could fly from Formosa directly to the Philippines and return non-stop. We could then eliminate our need for the carriers. The Admiral's aides doubted, however, that a single-engine fighter could carry out a mission of such range. Clark Field was 450 miles away from our own airbase, and Nichols Field, another major target near Manila, was 500 miles distant from Tanan. That meant, considering the factors of still air range, fuel for fighting, and fuel for reserve, that we would be required to fly non-stop for some 1,000 to 1,200 miles. No fighters had ever flown on such combat missions before, and there were vehement arguments among the air staff as to whether even the Zero was capable of this performance. There was only one way to determine this point. From then on, we flew literally day and night to stretch the range of our planes. Apart from its range, the Zero was designed to remain in the air on a single flight for a maximum of six or seven hours. We stretched this figure to from 10 to 12 hours and did so on mass formation flights. I personally established the record low consumption of less than 17 gallons per hour. On the average, our pilots reduced their consumption from 35 gallons per hour to only 18. The Zero carried a normal fuel load of some 182 gallons. To conserve fuel, we cruised at only 115 knots, at 12,000 feet altitude. Under normal full power conditions, the Zero was capable of 275 knots and, when overboosted for short emergencies, could reach its maximum speed of about 300 knots. On our long range flights, we lowered propeller revolutions to only 1,700 to 1,850 RPMs and throttled the air control valve to its leanest mixture. This furnished us the absolute minimum of power and speed, and we hung on the fringe of losing engine power at any time and stalling. These new long-range cruising methods 
extended the Zero's range by a remarkable figure, however, and our flight commanders reported the exciting news to Admiral Sukahara, who then dropped the three small carriers from his plans. Two of them returned to Japan, and one moved on to support our operations at Palau. As a result, the 11th Fleet became a fleet without any ships. We were curious, of course, as to the opposition we would encounter from the Americans. We knew little of the types of planes or the performance of the American pilots, except to anticipate that they would possess even greater flying ability than the pilots against whom we had fought in China. Not a man questioned the wisdom of launching the war. We were, after all, non-commissioned officers who had been trained, painfully, to respond immediately to orders. When we were told to fly and fight, we did so unquestioningly. At two in the morning on December 8, 1941, an orderly went through our billet at Tainan, waking my group of pilots. It had come. X day, as we knew the opening day of the war. The pilots slipped into their flying gear quietly and in small groups moved outside. The night was clear, moonless, with gleaming stars stretching from horizon to horizon. Overall was a deathly stillness, broken only by the sounds of our boots crunching on gravel and the low voices of the pilots as they hurried to the airstrip. Captain Masahisa Saito, our commander, told us that we would take off at 0400 hours and briefed each flight on its respective assignments for the attack on the American airfields in the Philippines. Then we could only wait. Orderlies brought us our breakfasts as we sat beside our planes on the runway. At approximately 0300 hours, a mist began to close on the airfield, a rare occurrence in this semi-tropical area. By four o'clock, it had become a thick pea soup fog with visibility reduced to only five yards. The loudspeakers on the control tower boomed out. Takeoff is delayed indefinitely. Our nervousness increased as the darkness wore on. We kept looking at our watches, cursing the fog. Three hours passed this way, and still the fog had not abated. If anything, it had thickened. Abruptly, the loudspeaker crackled. Attention! Here is an important announcement. The pilots listened in attentive silence. At 600 this morning, a Japanese task force succeeded in carrying out a devastating surprise attack against the American forces in the Hawaiian Islands. A wild, surging roar went up in the darkness. Pilots danced and slapped their friends on the back, but the shouts were not entirely those of exultation. Many of the flyers were releasing their pent-up anger at being chained to the ground while our other planes were smashing at the enemy. This attack created a factor which we must consider. The Americans were now warned of our attack plan, and it was incredible that they would not be waiting for us in strength in the Philippines. The tension increased as the morning approached. The fog had crippled our plans. Worse yet, it would allow the Americans to send their bombers from Luzon and catch our planes on the ground the moment the fog lifted. We manned our defense installations. Machine gunners slipped live rounds into their weapons, and every man on the field strained for the sound of enemy bombers. Miraculously, the attack never came. At nine in the morning, the fog began to lift, and the welcome sound of the loudspeakers told us that we would take off in only one hour. Every pilot and bomber crewman on the field climbed into his plane without awaiting further orders. Exactly at ten, the signal lights flickered through the last wisps of fog. One after the other, the bombers rolled down the long runway. One, two, three, then six planes were in the air, climbing steadily. The seventh plane was racing down the runway, one to two hundred feet from its starting point, when suddenly the right landing gear collapsed. With a great screeching roar, the plane spun along the ground on its belly, flames enveloping the entire fuselage. In the harsh glare of the fire, we saw the crew struggle through their hatches and jump onto the ground, then run furiously away from their plane. The next instant, a tremendous blast rocked the field as the bomb load blew up. None of the crew survived the explosion. Repair crews were on the runway in seconds, and the men proceeded frantically to drag away the twisted pieces of metal. Dozens of men raced against time to fill the smoking crater. In less than 15 minutes, the signal was given for the next bomber to resume its takeoff. By 10.45, all planes were airborne, 53 bombers and 45 Zero fighters. 
The fighters broke up into two groups, one staying with the bombers as escorts, while the other flew ahead to tackle the interceptors, which, we felt certain, after the long delay in our attack, would be awaiting us in great strength. I flew in the first wave, and our formation moved up to 19,000 feet. Soon after passing the southernmost cape on Formosa, I sighted a nine-plane bomber formation flying directly toward Formosa, apparently an enemy force out to attack our fields. Nine pilots, including myself, were briefed before takeoff to oppose any enemy aircraft discovered on our route to Luzon, while the others were to continue the attack as planned. We dropped out of the main formation and dove for the bombers. In seconds, I was in firing position and closed in to take the lead plane. I started to squeeze the trigger when I suddenly realized that these were Japanese army planes. I rocked my wings in signal to the other fighters to hold their fire. Those fools in the bombers. No one in the army command area had taken the trouble to coordinate their flights with the Navy, and these idiots were out on a routine training flight. We regained our formation when passing over the Bataan Islands, midway between Formosa and Luzon. These were occupied by our paratroopers, shortly after we flew over the islands, to provide a haven for any planes which might be forced to ditch on their return from the Philippines. Actually, we lost no aircraft through ditching. And then the Philippine Islands hove into view, a deep green against the rich blue of the ocean. The coastline slipped beneath us, beautiful and peaceful, without another airplane in the air. Then we were back over the China Sea. At 1.35 p.m., we flashed in from the China Sea and headed for Clark Field. The sight which met us was unbelievable. Instead of encountering a swarm of American fighters diving at us in attack, we looked down and saw some 60 enemy bombers and fighters neatly parked along the airfield runways. They squatted there like sitting ducks. The Americans had made no attempt to disperse the planes and increase their safety on the ground. We failed utterly to comprehend the enemy's attitude. Pearl Harbor had been hit more than five hours before. Surely they had received word of that attack and expected one against these critical fields. We still could not believe that the Americans did not have fighters in the air waiting for us. Finally, after several minutes of circling over the fields, I discovered five American fighters at a height of about 15,000 feet, some 7,000 feet below our own altitude. At once we jettisoned the external fuel tanks and all pilots armed their guns and cannon. The enemy planes, however, refused to attack and maintained their own altitude. It was a ridiculous affair, the American fighters flying around at 15,000 feet while we circled above them. Our orders precluded us from attacking, however, until the main bomber force arrived on the scene. At 1.45 p.m., the 27 bombers with their zero escorts approached from the north and moved directly into their bombing runs. The attack was perfect. Long strings of bombs tumbled from the bays and dropped toward the targets the bombardiers had studied in detail for so long. Their accuracy was phenomenal. It was, in fact, the most accurate bombing I ever witnessed by our own planes throughout the war. The entire airbase seemed to be rising into the air with the explosions. Pieces of airplanes, hangars, and other ground installations scattered wildly. Great fires erupted and smoke boiled upward. Their mission accomplished. The bombers wheeled about and began their return flight home. We remained as escort for another ten minutes, then returned to Clark Field. The American base was a shambles, flaming and smoking. We circled down to 13,000 feet and, still without enemy opposition, received orders to carry out strafing attacks. With my two wingmen tied to me as if by invisible lines, I pushed the stick forward and dove at a steep angle for the ground. I selected two undamaged B-17s on the runway for our targets, and all three planes poured a fusillade of bullets into the big bombers. We flashed low over the ground and climbed steeply on the pullout. Five fighters jumped us. They were P-40s, the first American planes I had ever encountered. I jerked the stick and rudder pedal and spiralled sharply to the left, then yanked back on the stick for a sudden climb. The manoeuvre threw the enemy attack off, and all five P-40s abruptly rolled back and scattered. Four of the planes arced up and over into the thick columns of black smoke boiling up over the field, and were gone. The fifth plane spiralled to the left, 
a mistake. Had he remained with his own group, he could have escaped within the thick smoke. Immediately I swung up and approached the P-40 from below. The American half rolled and began a high loop. At 200 yards, the plane's belly moved into my sights. I rammed the throttle forward and closed the distance to 50 yards as the P-40 tried desperately to turn away. He was as good as finished, and a short burst of my guns and cannon walked into the cockpit, blowing the canopy off the plane. The fighter seemed to stagger in the air, then fell off and dove into the ground. That was my third kill, the first American plane to be shot down in the Philippines. I saw no other fighters after that, but other Zero pilots caught a group of planes in the air. Later that night, back at Tainan, our reports showed claims for nine planes shot down, four probably destroyed in the air, and 35 destroyed on the ground. Clark Field anti-aircraft guns shot down one Zero, and four Uthers crashed during the flight home, but not a single plane was lost to an enemy aircraft. Chapter 8 The second day of the war, December 9th, we fought our worst battles against violent rainstorms, which came close to inflicting serious losses on our air units. Early on the 9th, we took off for Luzon. The weather was so bad that the bombers were forced to remain on the ground. The storms raged over the Philippines as well as at Formosa, and at the end of the day, we had shot up only a few planes on the ground. Torrential rainstorms broke up the big fighter formation on the return flight. The rain was incredible. It lashed at the light fighter planes in the worst downpour I have ever encountered. Swirling masses of clouds drove us to the ocean surface. Finally, we scattered into Vs of three fighters, with each group concerned only for its own safety. From a height of 15 and 20 yards, the water was a fearsome sight, lashed into white spray by the wind. I had no choice but to fly at this low altitude, my two wingmen hugging my tail, desperately trying not to lose sight of my plane. For hours we fought our way northward, our fuel gauges dropping lower and lower. Finally, after what seemed like countless hours, the southern tip of Formosa broke through the clouds. We circled through the downpour until we found an army air base near the coastline and with barely enough fuel for our approach, set down on the muddy runway. Thirty other fighters preceded me, and later that night we discovered that three fighters had made forced landings on a small islet near the army field. Not a pilot was lost, however. That evening was our first real rest in the three months since our assignment to Formosa. The shabby inn at the Hot Springs Hamlet was a small paradise to us, as we soaked in the tubs and turned in for a long sleep. The third day of the war is one I will long remember, for on December 10th I shot down my first Boeing B-17. It was also the first of the flying fortresses to be lost by the Americans in combat. After the war, I found that this particular bomber was piloted by Captain Colin P. Kelly Jr., the American air hero. We did not take off for Luzon until 10 hours a.m., since all the fighters first had to fly on to Tainan for regrouping, arming, and new orders. We left Tainan with a formation of 27 fighters. Over Clark Field, we found not a single target. For 30 minutes, we circled the burned-out American base, but failed to sight a plane either on the ground or in the air. The group turned north to fly cover for the Japanese convoy landing troops at Vigan. One light cruiser of the 4,000-ton Nagara type and six destroyers escorted four transports. An American account of this force, based on reports by the surviving crew of Captain Kelly's plane, grossly exaggerated the number of ships. According to the Americans, our force comprised the battleship Haruna of 29,000 tons, six cruisers, ten destroyers, and 15 to 20 transports. We maintained cover over the transports for about 20 to 25 minutes, flying at 18,000 feet when I noticed three large water rings near the ships. We were too high to see water pillars from bomb explosions, but the three rings were unmistakable. A second glance showed that none of the ships had been hit, although the American report of the attack claimed that the non-existent battleship had received one direct hit and two near misses and was left smoking and draining oil into the water. My fellow pilots and I were upset by the fact that the enemy had attacked despite our screening Zero fighters. We did not even see the bombers. A few moments later, 
after squirming around in my cockpit, I saw a lone B-17, about 6,000 feet above us, speeding southward. I called the attention of the other pilots to the single bomber, and we continued the search for the other planes we were certain had assisted in the attack. We had never heard of unescorted bombers in battle, especially a single bomber in an area known to be patrolled by dozens of enemy fighters. Unbelievable as it seemed that B-17 had made a lone attack in the very teeth of all our planes. The pilot certainly did not lack courage. We received the pursuit signal from our lead plane, and all but three fighters which remained behind, as transport cover turned and raced after the fleeing bomber. The B-17 was surprisingly fast, and only under full throttle did we manage to get within attacking distance. Approximately 50 miles north of Clark Field, we maneuvered to make our firing runs. Abruptly, three zeros appeared, it seemed from out of thin air, and sliced across the B-17's course. Evidently they were from the Kaohsiung Wing, which had strafed Nichols Field earlier in the day. We were still out of gun range when the three Kaohsiung fighters peeled off and made their firing passes from above on the big plane. The bomber continued serenely on, almost as if the zeros were no more bothersome than gnats. The thin air at 22,000 feet had the slight advantage of forcing a reduction of the zeros' performance. Seven of our fighters joined up with the three Kaohsiung planes and swung into the attack. It was impossible for the ten zeros to make a concerted attack against the bomber, for in the rarefied air, we could easily over-control and collide with another plane. Instead, we swung out in a long file and made our firing passes one after the other, each plane making its run alone. It was a time-consuming maneuver and irritated me because of the long wait for each pass. By the time all ten zeros had made their runs, we were flabbergasted. It appeared that not a single bullet or cannon shell had struck the bomber. This was our first experience with the B-17, and the airplane's unusual size caused us to misjudge our firing distance. In addition, the bomber's extraordinary speed, for which we had made no allowance, threw our rangefinders off. All through the attack, the fortress kept up a steady stream of fire at us from its gun positions. Fortunately, the accuracy of the enemy gunners was no better than our own. After my pass, I noticed that we were over Clark Field, and it appeared certain that the B-17 pilot had called for help from American fighters. We had to destroy the plane quickly, lest we be caught in a trap of our own making. But there seemed to be little purpose in continuing the long sweeping passes by diving down onto the bomber from behind. I decided to try a close-in attack directly from the rear. Greatly to my advantage, of course, was the fact that the early B-17 models lacked tail turrets, or I might never have been able to hold my course. Under full throttle, I swung in behind the bomber and closed in for my firing run. Two other fighters, watching me, moved up and, wing to wing, we raced in for the kill. The fortress guns flashed brightly as the pilot fishtailed from side to side, trying to give the side gunners the opportunity to catch us in their sights. But despite the frantic defensive flying, the enemy tracers missed our planes. I moved in ahead of the other two fighters and opened fire. Pieces of metal flew off in chunks from the bomber's right wing, and then a thin white film sprayed back. It looked like jettisoned gasoline, but it might have been smoke. I kept up my fire against the damaged area, hoping to hit either the fuel tanks or oxygen system with my cannon shells. Abruptly, the film turned into a geyser. The bomber's guns ceased firing. The plane seemed to be a fire within the fuselage. I was unable to continue the attack. My ammunition was exhausted. I banked away to let the Zero behind me have his chance. The pilot hung grimly to the B-17's tail, pouring in a stream of bullets and cannon shells. The damage was already done, however, and even as the other fighter closed in, the bomber nosed down and was speeding toward the ground. Miraculously, its wings were on, and even keel, and the bomber's pilot might have been trying to crash land on Clark Field. I dove after the crippled fortress, and, maintaining several hundred yards distance, took pictures with my Leica. I managed to get in three or four shots. At 7,000 feet, three men bailed out. Their chutes opened, and the next moment the B-17 disappeared into an overcast. Later, we heard reports that the Americans had damned our fighter pilots for machine gunning, the crewmen who drifted to earth beneath their parachutes. This was pure propaganda.
Mine was the only Zero fighter near the bomber when they abandoned their airplane, and I had not a single bullet or cannon shell left. The only thing I shot were photographs with the Leica. No Japanese pilot actually saw the B-17 crash, so credit for the kill was denied at the time. The bomber pilot's courage in attempting his solo bombing run was the subject of much discussion that night in our billets. We had never heard of anything like that before, a single plane risking almost certain destruction from so many enemy fighters in order to press home its attack. The discrepancies of the surviving crew's reports in no way detracted from the act of heroism. Later that afternoon, back in Formosa, we found the wings of two Zeros riddled with machine gun bullets, which had been fired by the bomber's gunners. Thirteen years after this battle, I met Colonel Frank Kurtz, USAF, pilot of the famed bomber Swoos, in Tokyo. Kurtz told me, The day Colin was shot down, I was in the Clark Field Tower. I saw his plane coming in, and you were right about his trying for a landing. Three open chutes came down through the overcast, and the cloud deck seemed to me to be at 2,500 feet. Then five more chutes opened. At least, it looked like five from where I was watching. Colin, of course, never got out. Chapter 9 That evening I found several letters from home, and a small package from Fujiko. She had sent me a cotton band to wrap about my stomach, with 1,000 red stitches. This was Japan's traditional talisman against enemy bullets. Fujiko wrote, Today we were told that our fatherland launched a great war against the United States and Great Britain. We can only pray for our ultimate victory and for your good fortune in battle. Hatsuyo-san and I have stood at a street corner several hours a day for the last several days and have begged 998 women who passed to give us each a stitch for this band. So it has the individual stitches of 1,000 women. We wish you will wear it on your body, and we pray that it may protect you from the bullets of the enemy guns. Actually, few Japanese airmen held faith in the charm. But I knew what it meant for Fujiko and my cousin to stand for long hours on the streets in the cold air of winter. Of course I would wear it, and I wrapped it about my midsection. Fujiko's letter set me to thinking. That night, for the first time, I thought of the enemy pilots. I had shot down as other human beings like myself, instead of unknown entities in their planes. It was a strange and depressing feeling, but, as with every other facet of war, it was kill or be killed. We continued our routine sorties from Formosa to the Philippines for the next ten days, and then received transfer orders to Jolo Air Base in the Sulu Islands, midway between Mindanao and Borneo, one two hundred air miles from our Tainan airfield. On December 30, I took off at 9 hours a.m. with 26 other fighters for the 1-200 mile non-stop flight to the new station. Here, new orders awaited us, and we flew 270 miles further south to Tarakan off the eastern coast of Borneo. Our flights were uneventful. We did not encounter any enemy planes. The enemy struck back at our units for the first time in January. Late one night, a lone B-17 caught the entire Tarakan force unawares. A string of bombs landed on the construction crew billets, which formed a perfect target for the unseen bomber, as the construction men stupidly disdained blackout procedures. The exploding bombs killed more than 100 men and injured many others, in addition to wrecking the group of buildings. Not a zero could take to the air because the Tarakan airfield was one of the worst in all the East Indies. Even for daytime operations, we found the slippery mud of the runways treacherous for takeoff and landing. During our arrival, two Zeros had overshot the sharp list of the runway and been demolished. The base commander flew into a rage and ordered naval pilot 1C Kuniyoshi Tanaka and myself to fly night patrol over the airfield. Tanaka was a former China ace with 12 kills and in the Pacific eventually shot down another eight enemy planes, flying until he was wounded and disabled. The night flying assignment was both difficult and dangerous. In those days, the Zero was unfit for night operations, and neither Tanaka nor I were even sure what we could do should enemy bombers attack. Fortunately for us, and the airbase, we were not disturbed again. On January 23rd, one of our convoys steamed out of Tarakan Harbour, bound for a landing operation at Balikpapan in Lower Borneo. 
headquarters ordered our group to supply air support, but at best, we could maintain only a light patrol of fighters over the vulnerable transports. Instead of the great numbers of fighters reputed to be at our disposal, in the early months of 1942, we had less than 70 zeros available for the entire vast area of the East Indies. And since a good number of the fighter planes were always undergoing combat repairs and a thorough overhaul after 150 hours of flight, we averaged 30 fighter planes at any given time for combat action. During mid-January, B-17 bombers began to arrive at the enemy's Malang base in Java and initiated attacks against our forces in the Philippines and throughout the East Indies. These planes proved effective in harassing surface forces on the islands, but their inadequate numbers prevented them from interfering with our operations. During the pre-dawn darkness of January 24th, we were afforded another demonstration of the Zero's glaring inadequacies for night combat. An American surface force stormed the Japanese convoy at Balikpapan in a savage, well-executed attack and blew several transports out of the water. We were unable, of course, to provide air cover of any sort before the American raiders were well out to sea again. And, even during daylight hours, we could mount an average patrol of only three planes over Balikpapan. In the spring of 1942, the first B-17s with new tail turrets made their appearance in our theatre. Up until this time, our favourite method of attack against the big planes had been to dive from behind in a sweeping firing pass, raking the bombers from tail to nose as we flashed by. We soon discovered this had little effect on the well-constructed and heavily armoured B-17. It was this knowledge, and not primarily the addition of tail armament to the fortresses, which brought about a sudden change of tactics. We adopted head-on passes, flying directly against the oncoming B-17s, pouring bullets and cannon shells into the forward areas of the enemy bombers. This proved temporarily effective, but it was soon negated by sudden evasive maneuvers by the B-17 pilots, which brought their heavy guns to bear on our incoming planes. The final attack procedure, and the most effective, was to fly high above the fortresses, dive vertically, then snap over on our backs, and continue to roll as we dove, maintaining a steady fire into the B-17s. During the afternoon of January 24th, Tanaka returned to Tarakan with his two wingmen after a patrol over Balikpapan. The three pilots were exhausted, although none was wounded. Tanaka reported that earlier in the day, his flight of three fighters had encountered eight fortresses, flying in two close formations. It was incredible out there today, Tanaka said. We caught the fortresses just right, and over and over I pressed home the attacks against the B-17s. At least twice I caught a bomber perfectly. I could see the bullets hitting and the cannon shells exploding in the airplanes. But they wouldn't go down. Tanaka looked almost haggard. These damned bombers are impossible, he spat disgustedly, when they work into their defensive formations. He went on to relate how his attack had, however, disrupted the B-17's bombing run, causing many of the bombs to fall harmlessly into the open sea. Only one ship was hit, a big oil tanker, and that was blazing fiercely when Tanaka left Balikpapan to return. The following day I took the Balikpapan patrol, with NAP Lai Sada Wahara as my wingman. Our two zeros were all that the airbase could muster for the convoy shift. The other fighters were needed elsewhere. Since Tanaka had encountered the B-17s at 20,000 feet, we cruised slowly in a wide circle at 22,000 feet. Tanaka had been unable to climb quickly enough from 18,000 feet to intercept the bombers before they started to spill their missiles into the air. Far below our planes, the tanker hit the day before still burned like a torch. Late in the morning, several specks appeared in the sky approaching from the general direction of Java. They came in fast, swelling in size until two formations of four planes each became clear. Fortresses in two close flights, exactly as Tanaka had found them yesterday. The rear flight flew slightly above the lead group, and, as we approached, the second group of planes moved closer to form a defensive box. The B-17s passed about a half mile beneath me. I rolled, Uhara glued to my wingtip and dove against the formations. I was still out of gun range, but flicked a burst as I passed them. 
I saw the bombs falling as I flashed by the planes. We rolled back and climbed steeply. I saw the water rings appearing on the surface. No hits. The convoy hadn't been touched. Back above the B-17s, which now were turning in a wide 180-degree sweep, we searched for a possible second wave of planes. The sky was clear. I moved into position again, a half mile above the rear of the formations. Now I'd see what Tanaka had been up against. I shoved the stick forward and rolled as I dove. The fighter picked up speed quickly. I kept the stick hard over, in a long rolling dive, firing with both guns and cannon. No results. Everywhere around me, the fortresses seemed to be filling the sky, and tracers arced through the air as we flashed through the formation. We slipped through without damage, and I climbed again for another dive. Again. Dive. Roll. Concentrate on one bomber. This time I caught one. I saw the shells exploding, a series of red and black eruptions moving across the fuselage. Surely he would go down now. Chunks of metal, big chunks, exploded outward from the B-17 and flashed away in the slipstream. The waist and top guns went silent as the shells hammered home. Nothing. No fire. No telltale sign of smoke trailing back. The B-17 continued on in formation. We swung around and up and rolled back in for the third run. The enemy formation continued on, seemingly impregnable, as if nothing had happened. The third time down I went after the bomber I had hit before, and again I caught him flush. Through the sight I watched the shells exploding, ripping metal from the wings and fuselage, ripping the inside of the fuselage apart. Then I was past the plane, pulling out into a wide, sweeping turn, going for height. The plane was still in formation. No fire, no smoke. Each time we dove against the B-17s, their gunners opened up with heavy defensive fire which, fortunately, seemed to have been impaired by the tightness of the formation. So far, I felt no damage to the Zero. I made two more passes, each time swinging down into a dive, rolling as I dropped, Yuhara right with me, each of us snapping out bursts with the machine guns and cannon. And every time we saw the bullets and shells slamming into the bombers, seemingly without effect. We had just completed the sixth firing run when the eight B-17s split into two flights. Four banked to the right, and the other four wheeled away to the left. Wahara pointed excitedly to the flight bearing to the right. A thin black film trailed the left engine of the third B-17. We had gotten through after all. I turned to follow the four bombers and pushed the throttle all the way forward, closing in rapidly behind the damaged plane. He was hurt, all right, dropping behind the other three planes. As I moved in, I saw tangled wreckage instead of the tail turret. The guns remained silent. At maximum speed, I approached to 50 yards distance and held the gun triggers down. Every last round poured from my guns and cannon into the cripple. Abruptly, a cloud of black smoke burst from the bomber, and he nosed down steadily to disappear into a solid cloud layer below. Back at Tarakan, I reported the details of the day's flight to my superior, Lieutenant Shingo. The other pilots gathered around us to hear my description of the firing passes. In their opinion, it was a miracle that I had come back at all, with the guns of eight fortresses working me over all at once. My ground crew found only three bullet holes near my fighter's wingtip. I have never been a superstitious man, but I could not help running my hand over the talisman Fujiko had sent me. The high command credited me with a probable for the day's action. Two days later, a Japanese reconnaissance plane reported that a B-17 had crash-landed on a small island between Balik Papan and Surabaya.